So our discussion of equalization ends with a technique which avoids the need for equalization. But I put it all in the same uh, area because basically it's another way of dealing with the threat of intersymbol interference. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at how we can avoid uh, seeing the impact of ISI. Not getting, the, getting ISI to be present and then trying to correct it, but instead arranging it so that the receiver we don't see the effect of ISI. Seems like a tricky idea. And the first concept that we have to master in order to understand the strategy is to look at orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM. Very, very popular technique in wireless. It's become very uh, widespread in, in wireless communications to use this technique uh, for many reasons. One of the reasons being uh, the way of avoiding uh, intersymbol interference. So, first of all, I'm going to start by trying to distinguish between frequency division multiplexing and OFDM, just because I don't want you to get confused about which one is which. Frequency multiplexing is typical when we have many users. For instance, if we have radio stations, we're going to give each one of the radio stations a different frequency, and we're saying we're multiplexing across frequencies. Uh, even in cellular systems, sometimes certain regions are given certain frequencies, for instance. Uh, and then the idea is that one user would one use one frequency, another user would use a different frequency. And in these cases, these users are typically physically separated from one another. Uh, for instance, if it's radio stations, they have different towers that are being used uh, by different radio uh, communications. Uh, typically in OFDM, you might be using non-coherent detection. It doesn't have to be, but it, it could be typical uh, to use uh, non-coherent detection. Now, OFDM... How is it different from this? First of all, it's typically, it's not that different users are diff using different portions of the spectrum, different frequencies. Here, all these frequencies, which are being multiplexed, are being used by one user. It's not a way to share the frequencies among different users. It could be, could be, I don't want to say not entirely. But typically, they're used for one user. Okay, so I take a band that's been given to me, I take that band of frequency and I divide it up and I'm exploiting um, multiple frequencies, multiplexing these frequencies within the band that has been given to me, a single user. Um, generally, it's not that each one of these subdivisions of bands is going to a different person, a different user, a different channel. It's all me, but I'm sending a different data stream to each one. It's not like I'm sending the same data stream on each subdivision. No, 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 no. They each have their own independent data. It's just all my data. And typically we're going to use coherent detection uh, for uh, OFDM. So um, if I were going to look at a FDM signal um, detection, it would look something like the FSK. It's like similar structure. Uh, if I wanted to detect a whole bunch of users, suppose I'm the cellular system, and I have some users using one frequency, another user using another frequency, but at the station tower, I want to re recover all of those. So I might have a filter for each one of the frequencies, and then I might do some detection. Uh, so this would be like one example of an FDM uh, approach. And so in that FDM approach, what would I be doing? Well, I would have a different channel, a different frequency, sub-frequency, for each one of my users, and they would be a space apart so that I could do this filtering, and I could just pull out the one that I wanted to detect. Now, what do I do in orthogonal frequency division multiplexing? And it's not like this at all. Instead, I pull all of those ideas of different frequencies, and I pull them together to be as tightly spaced as possible. Why? because I'm not going to use the same idea of separating them out with a, some filter. So it really doesn't matter. This, I don't need this guard fre uh, frequency. They can all be crowded in. In fact, I want them to be as close as possible to be spectrally efficient. So I have to assume that these are spaced so that they are orthogonal from one another. And we actually went through this calculation for frequency shift keying. If we looked at how what was the most spectrally efficient frequency shift keying we could do, and we found the minimum separation, it's really the same thing here. Except here, uh, I'm using, the, I'm treating this as one body of, uh, uh, one transmission media, as opposed to a bunch of separate transmission media. 
Here they're kept separate because I want to make filtering easy. Here I don't care about filtering and I want them to be compact. And so I actually go back to the theory and say how closely can they be? And in order to be the very closest, then I would have to ensure that they are orthogonal from one another. That's why we call it orthogonal uh, multi-carrier modulation or OFDM. So this would be a very typical spectrum for OFDM. It looks like um, maybe a sinusoids uh, that we see closely spaced here, one to the other. And if I look at this, I might not actually see these dips uh, between A and B, between B and C. It would look pretty flat to me because they were uh, so closely uh, knit. Uh, so this would be um, the typical spectrum. And uh, sometimes it's the spectral characterization of OFDN that makes it attractive. Today I'm going to talk about how it's robust against intrasymbol interference. But there are other reasons that uh, OFDM could be adopted. So um, why does OFDM, why is it so popular? Where did it come out of? Why did it pop up and suddenly be such a great solution used in many different applications? One of the reasons is that there has been the enabling technology which has become exceedingly affordable. And that affordability comes in electronics. So as VLSI has, has advanced, the digital signal processing required in order to accomplish this idea of uh, having very closely uh, spaced uh, subcarriers that are exploited uses the fast Fourier transform. And the fast Fourier transform, we have optimized that in our electronics. It's extremely uh, efficient. Uh, we have a lot of electronics that knows how to do this. And this is, you know, high performance and inexpensive digital signal processing, the FFT. So I'm going to explain to you today about why the FFT is the key enabler. But the first message I have to tell you is that it has been the VLSI um, evolution, revolution, evolution, that has made OFTM be so popular. So I said I was going to concentrate on how OFTM is robust to intersymbol interference. And to do that, let's go back to this example of the wireless channel. So I have a transmitter, I have a receiver, there's this line of sight collection, and of course there's also uh, the possibility to get many reflections from different kinds of surfaces and this gives me the multipath channel. So we've been discussing this and now we're going to look at it again but now for uh, another uh, perspective. So if I had only the line of sight I would have a nice direct impulse response for my channel but because of this rich environment of reflections I'm getting instead what we call a multipath channel with multiple returns and how uh, long the duration of these reflections are is called the delay spread of the channel. So if I look in the frequency domain, what does it look like for a channel with multipaths? Well, when I look at the frequency domain, I could take the FFT and it's frequently when I have multipath returns, I'm going to get what I call fades, deep fades. So this is typical in a multipath channel. And so I could look at it in the frequency domain or in the time domain. In order to understand OFDM, just like we saw with the equalizers, it's often best to look in the frequency domain to understand the principles involved in the solution, the technique we're using to avoid intersymbol interference. So that will be the case uh, here as well. So let's turn now to the principles of operation for OFDM. And the idea is when they have multipath uh, returned. That means if I have fast data transmission, so here's a data plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one. I'm sending this as my data that I send through this multipath channel, and the data received is actually going to uh, be um, uh, a superposition of uh, many returns. Okay, and so this is the intersymbol interference, of course, that we've discussed many times. So if I want to avoid it, what can I do? Well, one thing I can do is I can slow down the data transmission. Don't try and send it so fast. If I slow it down, if I just make the delay, the, the, the interval, the symbol interval, to be long enough, then all of those reflections will die out. And then I will have, you know, no ISI because I have... Uh, completely um, slowed down my transmission. 
And again, this spacing, the bit rate that I could transmit would be based on the delay spread of my channel. So sure, that works really well. But if you're trying to sell service, you know that your client wants faster, faster data delivery. So this is like not a very good idea of a solution. However, it is the seed to the idea of how we can use um, subcarriers in order to achieve this same idea of avoiding ISI by slowing things down. I could have used equalization. Of course, we've already seen that. I get this data received that is all over the place. And what I do is um, use an equalizer to zero it out or whatever. Uh, but that can be high complexity. It's maybe justified in some systems, but we might want to go for a system that's less complex and might be able to do it. So the solution is going to be to take the data and to parallelize it and to create multiple data streams. That way, each one of the data streams can be slower. And then I can still have the totality of all the streams keeping my net data rate high, even though in a given channel my net data rate is low. And that is what we call OFDM. Each one of those streams is on a separate subcarrier. So here's an illustration where I try and show you how this works. So here is um, the data I'm trying to send in um, eight different symbol intervals. And I tried to use a different color for each one of the symbol intervals. And I'm going to, instead of sending each one very, very fast, when I send each one very, very fast, what happens in the frequency domain? So this is the time domain. And over here in the frequency domain, because I'm sending this data very, very fast, it's pretty wide in the frequency domain. So that's what I'm trying to plot here. It's pretty wide. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first time slot, and I'm going to take the bit that would normally go in the first time slot, and I'm going to let it take its time. I'm going to let that bit be transmitted over the entire eight times, eight times the symbol duration. So if the symbol duration here is one TS, I'm going to let it go for eight TS. So it's going to take up one eighth in this numerical example, one eighth of the frequency spectrum because when I go slower in the time domain, that means I have a narrower frequency domain content. So I'm only, in, instead of using all of the available frequency domain, I'm just using a small part of it for just this data stream. And of course, you're starting to get the idea. I'm going to do that for each one of these different uh, transmissions. So I'm going to create eight parallel data streams. That's going to give me eight subcarriers. And altogether, you know, I haven't really saved anything. They're still occupying the same total frequency that they did before. It's just that each one of them is being transmitted slowly. So like they're only in a small slot. It's only in this frequency slot, but in that frequency slot, it's going very slowly. So even if there are many reflections, uh, it doesn't matter because I'm going so slowly that the reflections will have died down and I can do my detection without intersymbol interference. So it seems like, like a really, really good idea to avoid intersymbol interference. And it is a good idea. It works really well, but on top of it, it's like really efficient to do it in the electronics. So I said it was a key enabler. So this is the key idea. But how do we do this? Uh, we couldn't have done it before if we, if we were thinking like, oh, uh, like FDM. Uh, we would never have been able to do it. But we're going to think in a new way. How do we do this with the new DSP? And it's going to become really efficient. And before I talk about how we implement it, let's talk a little bit more about what's going on in the frequency domain. So I said I'm going to create these individual flows on different frequencies. So think of it here. One of these frequencies is going to be lower and the other one's going to be higher. And so this is the higher frequency. You see more oscillations going on. So they're each at a different frequency. And I'm going to be multiplying them by a different data stream. Remember, uh, I have one data stream here, another data stream here, etc. So these are uh, these different x's, this whole collection of data uh, that I've spread out in, in, to, to take up, to go slower in time. And then all of these are going to be combined so that I'm really transmitting one signal in the end. So I'm doing these all in parallel. 
on different frequencies, but it's going out of one antenna. Okay, it's not like FDM, where there are different users, different antennas, different oscillators, physically separated. That's not what's going on. This is one user, one set of data, we put in parallel streams, and each one of these parallel streams is modulated by a different frequency. But all of them are combined into one signal for transmission. So it goes through this multipath channel. Remember, this is the time domain description of a multipath channel with a delay spread, and this is the frequency domain representation. And remember, these have fades in it, frequently have fades in it. What happens is, in that fade, it's possible I'm going to lose a subcarrier. So it's possible I'm going to fall dead in the middle of a, um, of a fade, and that, that is possible. And so that is the trade-off in using this approach is that you might have to retransmit some data when it hits a deep fade. Um, but in any case, for sure, when I get the received signal, each one of these frequencies is going to see something, you know, it's not flat. They're each going to, some are going to get, you know, enhanced, some of them are going to get hurt, and so this is the nature of the OFDM. Um, the important thing is, of course, even though they're affected differently, the orthogonality of my signal is maintained uh, um, during the transmission. So we're using coherent detection for this OFDM signal. We've separated the data into different data streams, and each one of the streams we can use some advanced modulation formats, such as BPSK all the way up to 64 QAM. So, of course, the bandwidth uh, allocation would remain the same, and when we go up to something like 16 QAM, we just have more bits uh, per symbol, which means although it's occupying the same bandwidth, I could get a higher binary rate when I use larger M. So, for instance, in the Wi-Fi standard, uh, we maybe we'll start out with QPSK with two bits per symbol on each one of these different data streams, but uh, if this is when the signal is perhaps not as strong, uh, we're maybe far away. The two antennas are far apart from the access point and the computer using the Wi-Fi, for instance. And if we're closer and the signal is stronger, then of course I can go to a higher order modulation format and get the higher bit rate. So all of these advanced modulation formats are completely compatible with OFDM. So everything that we've learned to exploit for single carry modulation also applies to this multi-carrier modulation as well. So what are um, the characteristics of OFDM? The idea is that we divide the signal frequency band. We divide them into non-overlapping, completely independent subbands. When I say non-overlapping, I don't want to be um, confused about that. You can see that they're, that they're overlapping, but that's just the um, signal spectrum in each one of the subcarriers. They do have overlapping, but it's, it's, they're orthogonal, so it doesn't matter. But I mean that we just basically have bins, subcarriers, one next to the other, stacked right, right, right next to each other. And inside of each of one, we do a modulation, which uh, the signal might have uh, side lobes, but the side lobes are such that they are um, orthogonal to one another. But the subbands are separate subbands. Uh, each data stream is independent. It's not the same data stream which is repeated on different frequencies. Each one is a separate data stream. Because I use orthogonality, uh, they're very spectrally efficient, that I have been able to pack those subcarriers as, as tight as possible. I have the efficient implementation using the fast Fourier transform of the LSI. I mentioned it's compatible with advanced modulation formats, and it's very flexible because I can pick whichever modulation format happens to apply to the situation, the channel conditions that I'm existing in. And the whole point, remember, we start at the very beginning. The motivation for this exploitation of OFDM was to avoid equalization, to avoid the need for equalization, because we avoid the effects of intersymbol interference by breaking things up into separate data flows.